All right. Welcome and good morning on this lovely Thursday spring morning. Again, good morning and welcome everybody and welcome to our panelists. My name is Tara Garaya and I'm the president and CEO of Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. I'm very delighted to host our very first, if I'm not mistaken, women's panel to celebrate Women's History Month. And what a great uh, way to celebrate that than our esteemed colleagues and leaders and wonderful, amazing women in their own personal and professional right that are around this Zoom table um, who happen to be also uh, board members for Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. For those of us, um, those of you who may be new to our um, organization, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, or um, MBEP for short, is um, an organization uh, focused on um, uh, you know, creating the economic health and vitality of the region. And predominantly, specifically, I should say, we serve the Tri-County region of San Benito, Santa Cruz and Monterey County. And our mission is to improve the economic health and quality of life in the Tri-County region through triple bottom line of equity, economic vitality, and the environment. So I'm very excited to be here. We hope this will be a very conversational, sort of relaxed, laid back sort of conversation. Of, and to hear from our leaders on our board, what it's like to uh, lead organizations, what it's like to join the MBEP board. I mean, in, and in short few moments, we'll have an opportunity for everyone to um, introduce themselves so we can know um, more who they are. Um, but they are certainly truly accomplished women. They uh, represent a cross sector of uh, organizations, multiple industries from health to financial to nonprofit sector, academia and social and human services. Um, and they bring to bear their intersectional identity of who they are personally and professionally. And I'm very sort of excited that they will join us. Quick facts, the most people don't know or may not be aware that 75% of our staff at MBEP in, in fact are women. So MBEP strives to um, have gender representation and equity to the extent possible and are constantly learning and evolving as we try to exercise those values and principles. 50% of our um, female colleagues are women of color and 48% of our board members or board composition are also women. So um, just a quick little fact for those who may not know, um, our major buckets of work at MBEP are around housing, um, broadband access, economic and workforce development, and all things, as well as the tangential sort of issues is how I like to frame around health, climate, transportation, and education, because they're all interconnected, interrelated. Essentially, the glue of uh, all these various issues are, um, are, is impacted by our region. Um, so before I sort of rattle on and talk too much, I really want to make sure you get to know our um, esteemed panelists. So I'm going to call on our panelists, go around the sort of our Zoom room, and if our panelists could please um, provide your name, a brief introduction, uh, introduction of yourself, your name, your organization affiliation, and why did you join MBEP as a board member? We will start with Francine Rod. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Francine Rod, and I am executive director for First Five Monterey County. Um, and I joined the MBET board because early childhood development, childcare, and early learning are really becoming understood more as key economic growth and drivers uh, for our communities. And I wanted to help bridge the gap um, uh, so that we all understood that um, helping children and supporting children is, is everyone's responsibility. Thank you. Rosa Vivian. So I'm Rosa Vivian Fernandez, and I joined, uh, I represent San Benito Health Foundation, it's an FQHC, a community health center in San Benito uh, County. And I joined the Embed board uh, after a visit with Bud uh, Kalian, the, the founder of Embed, and, uh, and, and he, you know, told us about the, or told me about the uh, mission of the organization that seemed to fit in terms of our goals of ensuring that there's equity in housing uh, and, and service delivery in our region and partnering with uh, public private sector to ensure that. Thank you, Katie. Good morning, my name is Katie Castagna. I'm the president and CEO for United Way Monterey County. 
And we have been longtime members of MBEP, um, initially um, drawn to MBEP uh, through the housing work that's being done. United Way is fighting for the financial stability of, um, of everyone. We here in Monterey County are focused on our local residents. And um, that financial stability relates very much to housing, uh, quality early care and education and financial asset building. And I, I see that MBEP has a uh, regional opportunity for us to work collaboratively. And so when I was asked to join the board, I was really excited to um, continue my work in a new way with the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, good morning. I'm Sandy Easton. I am the Chief Operating Officer of Pacific Valley Bank, a Monterey County Community Bank. Um, I'm a fourth generation uh, from Monterey County. However, I've spent about 25 years of my banking career also crossing over the line into Santa Cruz County. I was the former CEO of a community bank over there. Um, I joined MBEC for what I call really synergistic reasons. I've been on the board of United Way Monterey County for seven years. I'm the current board chair. And all of the issues that are related within our two groups, you know, um, housing, early child care, um, child care education, all of those things, um, along with, you know, my love of the communities uh, really inspired me to join the MBET board. Thank you, Krista. Hi, I'm Krista Snelling, and I'm the president and CEO of Santa Cruz County Bank. And I joined MBEP because I am new to this area, which it's been 13 months now. So I'm sort of debating how long I'm allowed to say that I'm new, but I'm going to go with it, at least for today. Um, and I joined MBEP mostly just to learn and contribute to this community that is my new home. And as of right now, I'm doing more learning than contributing, but that will slip over at some point in the very near future. I'm really happy to be here, and it's nice to see you, Tara. Good to see you all. Nanette. Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Nan Mikowitz. I'm the hospital president for Dominican Santa Cruz. Um, just so Krista knows, it's 16 months. You can use it for 16 months. 16 months plus one day, you're, you're one of us. Um, I joined M MBAP a long time ago, probably uh, early on, like Rose Vivian. I did have my conversation with Bud, um, who encouraged me. But frankly, it made sense for us. We know that for our patients and our community, all the health and economic issues are tied. And of course, as the third largest employer in Santa Cruz, our own employees face all of these challenges. So really appreciate the broad spectrum of work that's being done. And it's an honor to be with all you nice ladies. So thank you for including me. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, Susan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am CEO of Community Foundation Santa Cruz County. I also joined the board following a conversation with Bud. Um, so I guess we have a lot in common. And uh, But of course, it was very mission driven for us. The Community Foundation works to bring people together um, so that everyone's resources, ideas, and skills can contribute to solutions in our county. And we certainly wanted to make sure that the voice of inclusive economic development was part of the MBUP conversation. And I'm really pleased to have you, Tara, in your new leadership role and pleased to be here with everyone. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Excited for this morning and excited, uh, you know, taking the cue from Krista and now now I'm only two and a half months in that I'm thinking, wow, I got a long time where, I'm, where I can use the I am the new. So thank you for uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, but all jokes aside, I am very happy and thrilled to introduce my co-moderator this morning, who also happens to be our incoming board chair for Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, and that is none other than Chancellor Cynthia Larry, who likes to go by Cindy. So I will continue to call her Cindy throughout this um, chat. Uh, so I, as you can see, those of you who are like on the webinar already, we have an amazing group of women of what I would like to deem as exceptional, amazing in their own right, personally and professionally, but all around badass women. I mean, and, and one of those women are none other than our chancellor who's going to be our board chair because I, I look at her sort of career, her personal and professional life, all that she has done, not only as a chancellor, but as a researcher, as a mentor, as a leader for young women, especially in the field of STEM. She is a, a, a bioanalytical chemist, um, 
as somebody who's a biologist or a, a degreed in biology, I, I have so much respect for folks who can be in the world of chemistry. She has written well over 155 publications and most recently has run, uh, written a lot around um, learning, active learning, and what does experiential learning mean in mentoring, especially in the academic arena. And she makes a, a strong effort to include women, others who have been underrepresented, especially in the STEM field. So, um, you know, my hat's off to her. Uh, collaborative leader by and large, known in her own sort of sector and field uh, to the amazing work that she's done and the efforts that she's making, not only at uh, UCSC as the chancellor, of which she started roughly three years ago, but her predecessors at UC Riverside and other places were also seeing her praises and accolades, this intentional, meaningful way of including women and people from the underrepresented communities. She herself is a first generation college graduate um, and sort of very um, sensitive and interested in, in, in the fully inclusive lens of bringing folks into the academic world. So we're very delighted at MBEP that she will be joining us as our chair. Um, I am delighted and look forward to her mentorship and guidance and as well as all the women around on this Zoom room as that I will call in our panel today. Um, UC Santa Cruz, a little known fact that most folks may or may not know, is a first in the nation for racial and gender diversity and leadership. If you just Google that or look on their website, you'd be amazed to find how Chancellor Lurie and her campus um, and Executive Vice Chancellor Lori have worked together uh, to be a place where the top administrative and academic leadership teams are composed of administrators from diverse backgrounds, life experiences, and identities. And 60% of her cabinet are women. Um, I'm taking a moment to give her a longer sort of intro, and I know she would rather that I didn't, but I think it's important to ground ourselves in this conversation of who the women are here, what our region sort of represents, and how fortunate we are to have um, a women leaders of this caliber really trying to give back to the community and to the organization. So, uh, you know, when it comes to breaking barriers in leadership, you know, Chancellor Reeve is truly uh, an amazing trailblazer. And so I will now turn it over to Cindy who will um, provide a brief opening remarks as well and then we'll kick it off with our questions. Well, thank, thanks so much, Tara. And I just wanna say how wonderful it is to have you here as the MBAP CEO. We now know you get to be new for 14 more months. So, so that, that's been a really delightful uh, um, uh, thing to learn. And as you mentioned, um, our campus is so proud to be named the number one research university in the country for racial and gender diversity and leadership. And diversity, diversifying our leadership at all levels is a campus goal because we know that with diversity comes excellence. We see that among the panelists that we have here with us today. And at UC Santa Cruz, we're committed to using inclusive recruitment best practices. We've developed leadership programs for staff and faculty. We focus efforts on creating diverse applicant pools for all our searches. And that makes a tremendous difference. Part of meeting the academic needs of our students is ensuring that they can see themselves in the faculty, staff, and leadership of our university. It's another reason that it's important that we're having this panel today. And Tara, I thank you so much for your leadership in bringing this all together. Representation matters because role models are important, but also because diverse voices and perspectives lead to better decisions, to better outcomes, and to an inclusive vision of the future. That's true for the future of my university, and it's true for the future of our greater Monterey Bay region. UC Santa Cruz is committed to providing educational access and opportunity. 57% of our undergraduate students are from one or more groups that are historically underrepresented in higher education. Those groups are uh, underrepresented uh, coming from either Hispanic, Black, or Native American Pacific Islander backgrounds, students who are the first generation in their family to attend college, or students who are from a low-income background. We recently announced an, an initiative to hire 100 additional faculty over the next 10 years. And when we couple that hiring initiative with an estimated 250 additional hires 
who will need to replace retirements that will likely occur in the next decade. That will give our campus an unparalleled opportunity to diversify our faculty for the benefit of our students, our research enterprise, and our future, advancing our role as an international national leader at the intersection of innovation and social justice. So uh, that's just a little bit of background about UC Santa Cruz and why we're so excited to be here today with uh, all, all of these great panelists and with those of you who've joined as participants. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, I wanted to start with the first question. And so Katie, I'm gonna ask you to kick it off and then I'm gonna to go to Sandy and Rosa Vivian. So the question is, is who have been your role models and how they influenced you who inspired you to be a leader and why? Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Cynthia. Um, and for me, when I think back, it's very easy to say it started quite young at the knees of my mother. And I have an amazing mother who was always very involved in the community, for everything from PTA to chairing the board of our local YWCA. Um, she, uh, early on as a volunteer, was engaged in the community and then, um, Later on, she re-entered the workforce because she had taken time off to uh, raise young children. Um, but then she went into human services, coalition building around domestic violence prevention, moved into philanthropy. And so I just feel very fortunate to have been able to study it at, at, you know, um, at her side and have her as a key influencer. Later on, you know, when I think back to the positions I've held professionally, I've reported to four people in my professional life and uh, three of them are women, very strong women. And I feel fortunate that all of them um, were great mentors and um, not only taught me professionally, but you know, I learned a lot um, by seeing how people navigate their personal values and their, their uh, personal life, you know, the work, the work life balance that we all um, struggle with as well. Um, but being able to report to women leaders in a professional capacity, um, as well as um, uh, I think, you know, my advice to anybody is, is making sure you choose the caliber of people that you are around who can challenge you and, and guide and teach you. So, um, but it started at home with my mom, I wanted to give her a shout out. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks, Katie. Uh, Sandy, how about you? Who've been your role, mo role models and who inspired you to be a leader? Thanks, Cynthia. Well, I have two quick ones and uh, one of them starts kind of like Katie with my mother, but um, ironically, not necessarily because she led the way um, directly. My mother's first, um, she passed away but uh, first generation Japanese, married my father who was in the Air Force, came here right after the war, spoke very broken English, and of course raised my brother and I during a time that uh, you know, being Japanese in the United States was, was not real favorable. So um, she had never been uh, stepped foot in, on US soil before and wasn't very welcome, including from my father's family. I did learn from her sometimes the very, very tough way, perseverance and standing up for yourself and being your own woman. It wasn't always a great easy road uh, with unintended consequences. She taught me a lot um, about leadership and being your own person. From the direct workforce, uh, I had one manager in banking for years. And ironically, she started her career as a stand-up comedian um, and then went into senior executive banking. And she was the toughest, scariest manager you could ever imagine, incredibly intellectual, but also the most caring. Um, and you always knew she wanted the best for you. So if you can imagine at one moment, you would shake in your boots because she was very direct and could crack that whip. And the next moment she would make a joke and you'd be rolling on the ground laughing. Um, but I would say she was a manager of mine for over two decades and definitively the most influential person as far as uh, work leadership goes for me. It sounds like you've had two really inspiring role models. How about you, Rosa Vivian? 
Oh, well, and your role models, and how did you get inspired to be a leader? Well, I actually grew up in Puerto Rico, and I was fortunate to grow up at a time where uh, at one point we had five generations that were alive. Uh, I had uh, my great grandmother, my grandmother, uh, and my mother, and uh, they were amazing women um, that uh, through perseverance and and positive thinking moved their families ahead. And uh, and and I grew up with a sense that uh, women were powerful. Um, there was a sisterhood amongst my my grandmother's uh, sisters, my aunts and my own uh, siblings, uh, we all come from large families and uh, our family is eight and I have five sisters that I greatly admire and I've learned from all of them. But primarily my mother who thought that uh, nothing was impossible and that you did the right thing and good things happened. And so she was a leader in her community making sure that um, children receive basic education and that we moved ahead because although she was not uh, greatly formally educated, she uh, achieved sixth grade education. She was actually a business uh, co-owner with my dad and she worked ahead and she said, the, the world is changing and you all need to be uh, going to college and, and I'm gonna make that possible. But she also did that for the children in our community, which she mentored, mentored and made sure that public education was available, quality public education was available to all of us. So while she's not here with us um, in, in person, she's, she's with me in spirit. In terms of my uh, career, well, I had an interesting career because I actually have a background in zoology. And I um, came back and, and, uh, and I was uh, completing my education at UC Davis and became interested in um, health by volunteer services at a local free clinic that was uh, founded by the Quakers. And it was the women from that, and it was women that were driving the, the clinic. And it was the women from that group that inspired me to volunteer in uh, a setting where they needed uh, Spanish speaking individuals. And later it was the uh, Latina women in the, um, in the California Hispanic Nurses Association that helped me transition from zoology to a public health um, background. Um, and so I ended up graduating from Davis and moving on to UC Berkeley. Um, so I was fortunate to find these women leaders and these mentors all, all around in my career that had led me from one step to, to the next. And I feel blessed and I learn every day from also the young women that, that I come into contact with both in the family and the work environment that inspire me every day. Thank you. I, I feel like I'm learning a lot right here. Thank you for sharing your stories and insight. This is amazing. Um, I'm going to kick it off with the second question, and this will be for Nanette, Francine, Krista, and Susan, and sort of starting with Nanette. What is the top of mind on issues impacting women today or moving forward? What do you think are the top, uh, for you, the top of mind issues? Um, you know, it's discouraging to say as a woman who's been in the workplace for 35 years now, um, that I think the biggest thing impacting us is balancing the career and parenthood. And, you know, especially in the last two years, I think COVID really exacerbated that situation. You know, here at Dominican, you know, a very large portion of our employees are female. And during the pandemic, many of them were faced with that challenge of, do I step away? Do I take care of my kids? I'm now an educator, a nurse, a mother, a, a wife, a, you know, a partner. It was so much. And so I worry about that, you know. Um, there's so much isolation that's occurred and the lack of ability to network that I'm concerned that we're going to lose women in the workforce. And I know we've seen it already, but I think it's going to be hard for them to come back. And um, we need to be in the, we need to be present. We need to be leaders. And I will say uh, we had a very massive exodus in terms of retirement um, here at the hospital at the end of pandemic in December. 
And so we lost a lot of our women mentorship as well. So we had some very seasoned team members who decided, you know, I survived the pandemic and now I just need to not be here. And our younger staff members are missing out on that, that learning. So that's, that's what definitely is keeping me up at night. Mm -hmm. Francine, how about you? What is the top of mind? Yeah, I mean, similarly to what Nanette said in terms of the, um, you know, now they've started to call it work-life integration because there is no balance, you know, in terms of um, equal. Um, and it, it feels like they are tugging at each other all the time, right? So how do we um, think about integrating all of those pressures that we're feeling? And that certainly happens more for the women um, than it does usually for the men. Um, and so that is a huge uh, challenge. Um, I'm going to put in the chat a link to um, the Central Coast Early Childhood Advocacy Network, because that is one organization that is really helping to lift up some of the policy issues that our women and children are facing. And they just did a survey. And in the survey, the top two issues that came out, one of them was childcare. Um, only 19% of our parents can afford childcare if they have um, one child and only 10% can afford it for two children. Um, that's full-time care. It is expensive to find quality, um, affordable and safe childcare. So that's a huge issue. And then mental health um, was the second one. And we're all feeling it um, because of the pandemic as well. And you know, we've seen rates of depression uh, increase. And again, it's um, hitting both men and women, but I think women are feeling it even more um, than the men. And what we're not really recognizing is the impact it's having on our children. Um, because they see and they feel all of this. And even though they're small and we think, you know, oh, they can't tell, or, but their body knows and their body holds all of this. And so those are the things that I think are weighing on our, on our, on our women right now. Wow, it sounds a little depressing, but you know, we all have resilience. You know, we've got it from our ancestors. And um, I know we're going to be getting to how we deal with some of these things or some of the solutions. So I don't want to end it on a such a, a negative note, but those are the issues that are pressing and we have resilience. So hold on to that as we keep talking. You're absolutely right, right. fair enough. Um, Krista. Yeah, I mean, I have the exact same thoughts as, mm -hmm. as Nan and Francine in terms of, you know, women taking on too much, not having, you know, the ability to make the choices that they wanna make for themselves, you know, in order to do that, you have to have the support systems in place. I mean, I've been fortunate in my career. I have a husband who does, you know, he'd laugh if he does way more around our house than I do and way more with the kids than I do. And, you know, I had parents that grew up, you know, 15 minutes away from my children up until I moved here. And, you know, having that support, support system is what allowed me, you know, to grow through the ranks and be where I am. And so, you know, what a gift, right? But what do you do if you don't have that? And, and figuring out how to get more support systems out to women is something that, you know, I think is a good topic to look into. I'd like to turn it to Susan before we open it up for a little bit broader. Susan, what are your thoughts? What are your top of mind? I mean, absolutely all of the things that uh, Nan, Krista, and Francine said. And I would just add a visual, which is I imagine, you know, some women just, you know, holding everything together. There's this image in my mind of women just sort of arms outstretched around family, trying to pay back rent, worrying about the eviction mor moratorium ending, trying to understand if they're going to be able to finish their career goals um, in their college and their education, understanding what to do with their kids after school. Now that school's back in, oh, they tested positive for COVID. Who's going to watch the kids so I can go to work? I mean, all the craziness and chaos of this year, I just imagine women just with their arms outstretched. But I also want to recognize all the women who are attendees today and panelists today who we are also joining and outstretching our arms around our communities. And it's really women that have held so much together um, for each other and for other families and for other employees and um, building coalitions and movements and really working to strengthen our community. So there are so many of you in the attendee list and I'm so glad you're here because I wanna recognize how much you've kept your arms around our communities in this last couple of years. Um, and thank you, Susan. That's one of the most important things that we can do is to care for each other. And I think this community does that in so many ways. Uh, I, I would like to uh, really 
uh, thank all of you who shared those concerns. There are concerns I think we all hold it, it kind of in our hearts, but, um, but to have them named in the way that you did was really, really helpful and inspiring. And so we heard too in the first round of questions how important mentors and role models are. So I'm I'm gonna um, I'm gonna impose on Tara first, and then open up the conversation for everybody uh, to to just think about uh, if you're willing to share a little bit personally. And Krista did this a little bit, you know, about her personal experience. How are you navigating work-life balance? Um, you, you know, so I'm at a stage where my kids are now grown. I get to be the grandma. Uh, um, and my parents have passed, but I remember being sort of squished in a sandwich between the demands of the kids caring for my aging parents. So Tara, I think you're going through all of that, and then you moved. <laughs> so so let's hear from you, Tara, if you don't mind, and then uh, let's open it up to the whole to the whole panel for anybody who'd like to have share about their own experiences. Uh, uh, thank you, Cindy. Yeah, happy to share. So I am in the sandwiched uh, life as we speak currently. Uh, as most folks may, may know, I, I'm a mom to two little girls. So I have a five and seven year old um, and I have aging parents and aging uh, mother-in-law. Uh, and the good news is we're back in California, right? So I'm here in the regions. I'm close enough to be my, with my parents and my mother-in-law within four to five hours. Whereas in the past, I was on the East Coast, so it was a little bit tougher. I racked up a lot of frequent flyer miles because I was here every eight weeks, almost on the, like clockwork to see um, my parents. And I'm the eldest of five and culturally, socially. So there's a lot of different expectations one needs to manage. And as many have already mentioned, you know, our very sort of identities we bring to the table. Um, you know, I'm a, a daughter, a sister, a mother, a daughter-in-law, a sister-in-law, a stepmother. I'm a stepmom to three boys, young men, I should say, um, in their early 20s, one who just graduated from UC Santa Cruz, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah, so um, I, you know, as Francine mentioned, the balance, you know, there's ebbs and flows. I, I, I like how we're now calling it more of an integration, because I think as employers, as um, leaders, we need to figure out how we support our, um, our our employees with that integration versus like, oh, you're expected to balance because it's just, I don't think normal <laughs> to be able to balance. Sure, there are times when, you know, one, um, the needs are higher in one area than the other. Um, there's peaks and valleys of what the, um, you know, with family versus work needs. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever been able to really strike that balance. What I have <clears throat> been able to learn over the years as I'm getting older is um, th this notion of not having to be perfect and everything having to be perfect, um, asking for help, being willing to say no when there is too much on your plate. Um, I, I am a, I'm hardwired as the oldest, of maybe my birth order, uh, maybe as a Muslim American Punjabi a woman. I, I don't know if it's cultural, social, there are a whole lot of layers that make up who we are, right? Every day that as we show up, um, that that's been the hardest lesson is to ask my husband for help, ask my parents for help. Um, as I sit and talk to you, I'm actually in uh, away from my children and I'm rarely away from my children. I can count on one hand the number of times I've been away. Um, you know, who are with my parents and I'm at a conference and I'm in part of this conversation, which I think is important and necessary and vital. Uh, but it's learning to manage all of those things, you know, simultaneously. And, and, you know, someone described earlier, like the sort of worry of like, for the first time, my children are in a peer setting. So they went to public school for the first time in over two years. We also had COVID early February and on and on. So, it's, uh, I think, trying to uh, be resilient in that, you know, tomorrow will be better. I, I have a high sense of um, hope and faith. I think my faith also grounds me in taking a moment to just breathe. Um, and, and, you know, just this belief system that things will be better. I am also surrounded by wonderful, um, not just family, friends, but uh, great staff that I've been able to walk into a great organization. Uh, who have helped me 
you know, there are women actually behind the scenes right now, as we speak, who are helping with the background sort of like, you know, the puppeteering to make sure that all is working well. Um, so I, I think it's the asking for help. It's, a, it's recognizing what's on your plate. What can you do? Um, you know, the, the saying, you know, how do you eat an elephant? It's literally one bite at a time, slowly, intentionally, thoughtfully, and not to inhale it all at once because that will not get you anywhere. And being mindful of my spiritual, emotional, and physical needs that I, I need to be healthier in those in that aspect as well. For me personally, that also helps ground me and to exceed and succeed um, in my uh, professional life and my personal life it keeps me grounded. So I, there's no magic bullet, I think. I think it's also having this village of, um, of women around you to be able to have these conversations and be allowing yourself to be vulnerable. That is also one of the biggest lessons I've had to learn in the last couple of years is, especially once I became a mom, you know, um, I was a very high achieving, overachieving professional woman who chose to have children a little bit later than most people do and, and stopping. And that, um, I think, really grounded me to uh, recognize my own limitations and also allowing myself to be vulnerable where I never was <laughs> before. So um, that, um, that, that, that that's my story. Thank you for sharing. I, there was a, some Kirsten List put into the chat a quote that I was going to read because it just it sounds really um, uh, appropriate. It says, uh, she says, a radical female organizer has a quote I love, reorganizing professionalism to include our humanity from Artemisia Shine. Anybody else on our panel want to chime in around this uh, navigating work-life balance? Well, sure. I, have a, I have a thought. Um, sort of, Tari, you sort of um, touched on it a little bit, but one of the things that, that I do because I just can't do everything is I just prioritize the things that I think are important with respect to my house and my kids and whatever, do the most important things. And I just do not worry about any of the rest of it because otherwise the stress and the guilt and all of that would be soul crushing. And so I just let it go. I mean, easier said than done sometimes, but um, it gets easier. <laughs> Krista, you'll have to be my role model. <laughs> Do you have something to say? I would add on to um, what you both have already brought forward. And, you know, I started my career in medical school and I met my husband and we've been together now almost 40 years. And so we were very blessed because we set our village up really early and that's not always possible. But because we had our first children when I was a resident, um, he had to learn how to take care of twins by himself every mm -hmm. third night. And so I think, you know, having that village is really important. But at the end of the day, we just have to be kinder to ourselves. You know, I look back, I was in the sandwich generation. Sadly, I've lost both my parents and miss them dearly. Um, my kids are grown. I, I see my daughter now with her newborn, and he's eight months old. And I just, I'm constantly reminding her, like, be kind to yourself. No one really cares that your house isn't clean and, and ask for help. And so what I do every week is for her is I call her and I say, when do you want me to come? Mm. And I will sit and I'll do it or I'll clean. You just tell me what you need. Ask me what you need. I'll spend the night so you can get a good night's sleep and I'll be gone early in the morning so you can have your family life. And I think that we just need to be willing to be part of a village, to be flexible as part of that village, but also to just be kind to each other and ourselves because life is tough and it doesn't have to be. There's a lot of fun stuff that um, at least I have. I have a lot of fun, you know that, so... <laughs> Well, fun, fun is is important part of life, right? Tara, maybe I'll turn it back to you and we can move on with our questions. But thanks, everybody, for sharing that. I think that was really helpful for me and I'm sure our participants. Absolutely. I, I agree. I think sort of to a little bit dovetail on that is I, I wanted to ask, what is your advice to the women and the girls watching the webinar to help drive their success or maybe more from a professional point of view? What, what is the number one thing you think they should possibly avoid? Um, you know, there's a lot of, of women on our panel right now or people who have tuned in. What would be your advice as they're watching this? How could they drive their success or be successful more professionally? Um, and I'll turn to Francine. Thank you, Tara. That's a, 
a really um, deep question, right? So I'll start with the avoid. And I think the thing to avoid is toxic relationships. Um, and, you know, people who are clearly not there to lift you up and to support you that, you know, life is hard enough, and especially for women and women of color, that you want to surround yourself with people who are positive and who will help support you. And that can be, and, and help you stay grounded in your values, um, spiritually, professionally, and personally. And that can be someone who's older. It can be someone who's your same age. Um, it can be someone who's younger. My staff, the, you know, the folks that I work with do that all the time. And in fact, I like shared these questions with them. I said, look, what would you guys say? So what I'm saying is not coming just from me, but it's also coming um, from some of them too. So that's really important to help you find people that will help you speak truth to power and help you stay grounded um, as well. Uh, I think um, in terms of things to, to also do, uh, it's really important as we just talked about to take time for yourself but, and to reflect, take time to specifically reflect and meditate. Um, and then the other thing that has been something that I have really um, focused on quite a bit is um, the trust equation that it's really important to think about how to build trust. And, um, and that includes being credible, being reliable, also being vulnerable in terms of admitting when you are, have made a mistake, um, communicating in you know, clear and transparent ways and how you're showing up. Are you showing up for yourself or are you showing up for others? And if we're able to do those things, we can build trust and um, you'll know, have trust in yourself um, and uh, then you'll build trust in the community as well. Thank you, that's really important, absolutely. Um, Susan. Likewise, Francine, I feel like you know, our learning and our growth happens in relationship mm -hmm. with each other and so the relationships we choose are so, so, so important and make sure to surround yourself by people that you wanna be more like and who help you be the best person you wanna be. And I think that's really key. Um, more practically, I would say for anyone who's interested in social impact kind of work, it's really important to, to do that work. You know, if you're interested in public health, do community health outreach. If you're interested in, you know, prison reform, work in a prison, like really understand the issues deeply with your own experience. I think too often we feel like, oh, I should get that job that's really exciting, but it's kind of removed from the thing that you're interested in. I think it's really important to spend that time, you know, before you go to graduate school, before you, um, you know, go work for something fancy, like spend that time um, with people. That's, that's going to be your best educator I have found in my life. Um, so I think, I think uh, yeah, surround yourself in really good company and, and do the work that you really care about before feeling like you need to advance somewhere else. And then I guess the last thing, just based on the, the kindness lesson that um, was mentioned earlier, um, when I was um, at the Sanford Graduate School of Business, I heard this really incredible woman leader who said, um, it's not about having, like having it all right now. It's about like, if we're lucky enough over the course of a lifetime, maybe we'll get to have it all, you know, like, so don't worry like, oh yeah, you know, like your kids didn't get a bath tonight and their homework didn't get done. And you're like, you're just feeling like you're not good at anything. Well, that's cause like, it's too much, but maybe over the course of a lifetime, things will integrate and balance. And I, that for me has been really helpful. Like I have peaks and valleys of really work heavy times, really family heavy times, fun times, whatever, but it's, it's about the course of a lifetime. So hopefully we'll all have the good health and the good fortune to have that, um, have it all over a lifetime, whatever it all means to you. Absolutely, that makes complete sense. Uh, Krista or Nanette, do you wanna add? What, what is your advice and what do you think folks should avoid? So you guys are so much nicer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, when you ask about in business and you ask about in your career, I, I, I say two things and I tell this to young people that ask me, you know, seize the opportunity when it comes. It's never the perfect time. I would not be in this role if I had said, you know, my kids are too young or I just can't do it or it just seems like too much. I wouldn't be in this role. I would be happy still, but most likely I, I liked being a doctor, but this is a very gratifying role. And I think in terms of what not to do is don't accept 
things as they stand. So when you get a new job or when you are wanting to go to a new role, and I do this all the time now, and I actually told this person that I used it and he was really kind of proud of it. But you know, think about one of your male colleagues who never settles for unless it's absolutely what he wants. And so what I do now is, you know, what would David do? Like, so you're telling me this, what would David do with this? Now, communication styles, you know, continue your own personal positive communication styles, but they wouldn't, men don't accept just anything. They negotiate, they, they do all of that. And I think, you know, negotiate for your time, negotiate for what's important to you. So that's what I tell, you know, my daughters who are in their thirties, their friends, their girlfriends, everything, just, you know, what would, what would fill in the blank do? and then do it nicer. <laughs> well, and Nan, I'm I'm laughing because I have something like that as one of my answers for a later question is like just tell people apply for a job when you only that you want when you only have 75% of the qualifications instead of 100. Like mm-hmm. just do it. You know, throw your hat in the ring. Don't settle. So I it's the themes are the same everywhere. But, and the only, the other thing I would add is um, I am a huge proponent and advocate with all of the younger women that I talk to about the advantages of networking and mentoring and really being very intentional about using it and building it. So just can't really say enough about that either. Yeah, that's so important. Um, And um networking, mentoring, and, and not holding yourself to too high a standard. I really like what you said, Krista, about being willing to apply for the job if you don't check every one of the boxes, because many of us feel that we have to overachieve to be able to get the recognition we, we deserve. But we have such a great uh, panel of successful women. I, I want to ask um, Rosa Vivian and Sandy and Katie, what are the two factors that you attribute to your success? Well, for me, it's been seizing that opportunity that may not have been what you envisioned. Going from, I wanted to go to vet school and I ended up in public health. That was an opportunity that came before me that was not what I had planned in my head. And also um, taking the opportunity to engage with mentors. And, And the mentorship can come from a lot of different places. Uh, it can come from other women, but it can also come from male allies that see something special and are willing to uplift you and move you forward. And don't give up on your dreams. This past week, I learned that one of our staff members in the, in the context of interviewing another person saw forensics and said, well, you know, I, I really uh, like the, the, the forensics as a career, that would have been my dream career. And I said, well, why is it that would have been? If that's what excites you, then follow that passion and seek that opportunity to, to move forward. So, so, so now you're gonna you know, get with this new employee and you're gonna find out how you guys can together get to what your goal is because don't give up your dream. We've been so focused in the last two years in surviving that we need to move forward into thriving and thriving with what were our dreams, what should continue to be our passions and seek those mentorship opportunities to ensure that that we are fulfilled uh, to the optimal level. Mentorship is really important. And and I've been watching the chat and there's some some folks uh, talking about networking in the chat. Networking is a great way to find a mentor. And I noticed that Folks are sharing their LinkedIn um, LinkedIn uh, uh, identities. You know, MBEP also has a LinkedIn presence, and I would encourage those of you on LinkedIn to follow MBEP and and help us help us broaden our community in that way. So, uh, how about uh, you, Sandy? What would you talk about your two um, two um, things that you attribute your success to? Well, you know, um, Rosa Vivian just talked about. And I would say, you know, mine are in the arena of two P's, passion and perseverance. But, you know, passion first and foremost, I think most everybody that knows me well knows that I go about my life with a deep, deep sense of passion for what I do. I don't go into a job or my nonprofit work or, you know, family, friends, whatever. I, I do it with a 
a deep passion that that is fueled by a spirituality as well. Um, something that I believe in. I'm not do. I don't believe. I don't know if any of you have heard the saying, um, especially as women, the shoulds. We have a case of the should, so I should do this, I should do that. And I learned um, many years ago from a therapist, and I will always remember this, um, what I say to myself and then what I'll say to my daughters, my son, my friends, um, I won't should on myself, but don't should on me. And it's, it's a perfect thing to follow if somebody says you should do this, no. I'm doing things because I'm passionate about it, not because should is more driven by guilt. You know, do you want to do it? Is it a desire or is it should? So again, it's that I will not should on myself and please don't should on me. So passion number one, driven by a spirituality behind that. And then perseverance in life is, as others have said, life is hard. <laughs> it just is. And whether it's, you know, our jobs or, you know, sometimes thinking the grass is greener on the other side and it's not, um, but we just have a way to persevere um, and find adventure and fun in everything that we do. Um, if not, then, you know, make that choice and, and make a change. So those are my two key factors, passion and perseverance. Oh, thanks so much. I'll, I'll follow up on that. Um, your perseverance reminds me of mine, Sandy, which is really work ethic. You got to work hard and keep showing up. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so you might have a lot of other qualities and opportunities, but if you don't, you know, apply it and, and put the time and passion into it, then you're not going to be successful. I also want to acknowledge for myself, really thinking about, you know, what I attribute my success to, um, it really is the great fortune of having the family support that I've had. So, you know, my, my parents provided me with the best education that they could. And um, that of course opened many doors. Um, and uh, I, you know, I had a wonderful um, upbringing and then to uh, have a husband that I've, we just celebrated 28 years um, uh, together, our anniversary. Um, and my husband has been extremely supportive, not only of my career, um, but as a partner in raising our family and, um, and really keeping, I guess, for me, the priority of, of family does come first. And um, work is important and we're all out there trying to do our part to save the world. Um, but uh, for me, having it all grounded and always making sure that my family is taken care of and, and acknowledging that I couldn't do the work I'm doing if I didn't have that kind of family support. Um, so I just come from a place of, of real appreciation for that, recognizing not everybody has that advantage. Um, but that that is really critical. And if you if you if you're not um, really grounded at home and, and putting your um, your family, your children first, then um, the rest of it is not nearly as meaningful. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, that makes complete sense. You know, I, I've been reflecting this entire time about the privileged place that I'm in and, and, and most of us are on this panel where uh, first of all, we can have these conversations, right? And, and inspire each other and lead and be leaders in our own right of various organizations and in our philanthropic work and our community work and with our schools and with our children. Um, and it's not the same for everybody and sort of holding that space also for other women who need those supports. Uh, pivoting just a little bit um, to your leadership in your workplace. Um, I want to turn to Katie, Sandy, and Rosa, Vivian again, and anyone else who wants to sort of jump in is, how do you encourage an environment at your workplace that is representative of the constituents and the communities you're serving? In other words, what strategies have you employed for greater gender representation, inclusivity, belonging, and diversity? Um, how are you leading the way or creating the space within your own organizations? And can I, I'll start on this one too. Um, with, I, I find it interesting with the gender inclusivity because my career in human services has been, um, uh, the workforce is dominated by women. So um, for me, when I think of gender balance in my organization, it's really how do we recruit more men into our team? Um, so, uh, you know, it cuts both ways. It's, it's quite interesting. And I, so I feel fortunate to, um, 
really have a rich environment of women colleagues. Um, but I think, uh, it, again, it goes back to my theme of family, but having a family friendly workplace. We are actually part of the Bright Beginnings uh, family friendly workplace program. Mm -hmm. We've been uh, uh, certified in that regard, but really offering the flexibility and um, respect and support to your employees um, to put their families first. And that's, you know, having flexible work schedules, you know, um, allowing them to uh, uh, support their families in the ways that are important, um, whether it's, you know, bringing your kid or dog to work when you need to um, and, uh, and, and recognizing that, again, if they don't have their um, family support in place that, you know, they're not going to be the best employees to you. So, um, and, and then I also think that grounds you in the realities of the people you're trying to serve too, because we are, you know, we're all living in this community trying to do our best and uh, understanding that our, our own employees, um, in order to support our community, and reflect them, we need to um, continue to recruit, employ, and retain those community members. Hi, Tara, it's Sandy. I'll, I'll, I'll address the first part of that question about encouraging an environment in our workplace that's representative of the constituents and communities we serve. Um, so we have employees that live all over um, the Monterey County area, and we have an internal suggestion box across the company where employees can voice their issues, improvements. But one of the big things that we do is of the communities um, that they live in, that they care about, that they serve, all the way from, you know, Southern Monterey County, whether it be King City, Soledad, up um, to the North County area. Um, one of the things that we really do and are supportive of the impacts on the communities where our employees live. All the rest of the community banks in our area were extremely philanthropic. And one of the, um, one of the point factors, if you will, in a request that comes across is if it's coming internally from an employee. Um, if it's something very important to them that they're representing, it might not even be where we have a branch, but it's where our employees live. So that's one of the ways where I think that, you know, we're very thoughtful and mindful of that employee and what matters to them. And it, it much of the time is the communities in, in which they live and they serve. So that's one of the ways that, that we do that. Perfect. Uh, Rosa Vivian? Yeah, so so uh, as, a, as a representative of the Federally Qualified Health Center, it's part of our, our guidance is that we are to represent the community of service and our board uh, is a representation of the uh, patients. So the majority of our board are, are consumers of the services that, that we provide and also they represent the community of service. Uh, the other is that we purposefully um, higher within the community of service and provide mentorship opportunities to ensure that our staff are able to advance in their careers. So it, every position in our organization um, comes in that fashion. We are active in teaching. So in an experiential experiential teaching, which means that, you know, they, uh, people come in for their medical assistant, dental assistant, PA, nurse practitioner experiences at our organization. And we try to hire from those that actually come in and complete their practicum because it is part of the career advancement plan for our organization. And we involve all aspects of the organization in interviewing new staff. So, um, so they, uh, our staff have an opportunity to select peers that they believe are representative, not just representative of the community, but that can best serve our patient population. Um, the other is that we actually have a salary survey that we conduct every two years and it's based on value and contribution to the organization rather than a step. And one thing that's really important for, that I believe is really important, the difference between men and women is that men negotiate, right? So um, sometimes there are disparate uh, salary ranges within an organization because you have better negotiators. And um, we make our salary survey so everyone has an opportunity and it behooves our supervisors and leadership 
to ensure that no one gets left behind. And that just because someone asks doesn't mean that the one that doesn't, doesn't have that same opportunity. And we teach the young people to actually ask. So this past week, once again, I had a Pearl of Wisdom uh, young staff member asked for a, a salary increase, new person. And I said, I'm so proud of you that you asked for that salary increase because they think that it's important that you ask for things in your career. And that's we need to mentor women um, to ask and also minority uh, women uh, and, and diverse people to ask because it may not be within um, the cultural upbringing, but it's important to ensure equity in, and a good standing in, in uh, a good place for the future. That's right. We've been talking a lot about women today, but we know that people of color as a group have shared many of the kinds of challenges that we've talked about. And so this next question follows up on that idea. It's for Nanette, Francine, Kristen, Susan. Um, so we've been through a global pandemic, um, economic turmoil that we're trying to recover from, uh, the C session, that's to say, but we've heard of kind of the great quit, right? And we've had calls for racial justice and equity. So what can we do to meet the moment by supporting the success and contributions of women and people in, of color? And I wanted to follow along with a question that was posted in the, in the Q&A section, which asks more specifically about any kinds of groups or programs that connect women with potential mentors within our region. So if you know anything about those, kinds of ideas, maybe we, we can broaden that to also think about uh, connections for people of color and women. So uh, Nanette, can you get us started? Sure. Um, so I, you know, this question gave me a little bit of pause because you know it seems like we're all doing so much already. It seems like one more thing and yet it's really not. Um, I think we need to be very intentional in our efforts. And I think uh, we have opportunities to lift people up that we don't always take. Um, you know, for example, celebrating any of the successes or contributions in our organizations or community uh, that are made by women and also women of color, I think is really important. I also, you know, in my work, um, try to look for ways that we can be an active participant in addressing um, these inequities. And one of the things that is happening and I'm just thrilled that it happened, is um, Common Spirit, uh, which is a national hospital organization that includes uh, Dignity Dominican. Um, they decided to enter in a relationship with Morehouse University School of Medicine. And they put a call out to all the hospitals to see you know, who would like to have a graduate medical education program um, with Morehouse and Dominican was selected. And I just see this as such a unique opportunity for us. If you look at, um, there's so many statistics, but the one that I looked saw yesterday that made my eyes pop, you know, there's over 20,000 or nearly 20,000 students in medical school right now, and only 1,600 of them are Black men. I mean, think about this. In the time of COVID, how many patients didn't get vaccinated, didn't seek health care because the doctors don't look like them and they don't know that they don't have that shared experience. And so they don't understand. And, and so I just see this as a really exciting way for us to do a small part um, to help lift up the graduate medical students. And, you know, we'll be working with our local FQHCs. And I just think we all have to be intentional and keep looking for where we can help. And I don't know about the mentorship, but I'm definitely interested in participating if someone does know about that. Well, well, thank you. And, it, and it, in the past, you know, before the pandemic, I think MBEP convened uh, networking uh, meetings. And so maybe MBEP can play a role there too. So Francine, what, what, would you be, what do you have to say on this topic? Um, well, this is a obviously a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. And it's a, ch it's a challenging one because I feel like it all really starts with ourselves and we have to um, really dig deep and look at what we know about race and gender and equity ourselves. And over the last couple of years, I've been digging deep into my own understanding of race and uh, equity and have been, my eyes have been really opened um, quite a bit about my own 
uh, journey and my own systemic oppression. And you know, you can you can be an, an oppressed oppressor. And so thinking about um, the ways in which we were brought up and the privilege that we had that Tara started to talk about it and the system in which we have grown and learned what success, what the definition of success is, right? And um, so for me, I think it really starts with us uh, really stepping back and reflecting ourselves on our own history and our own support and our own privilege and where that came from and how it was taught to us and how it is continuing to be projected. And then stepping back and saying, is that okay? And is that something that I want to help continue to perpetuate? Or is it something that I feel like we need to look at as a broader system to change? And so that's where it's really important to me for us to have trainings in our own workforces. Um, first, um, again, starting with yourself and then looking at your workforce and seeking ways for us to grow and understand different cultures so that sometimes we don't necessarily need to say, you have to do it this way because you're here, but us understanding better about what the culture and the history is we can grow from that as well, right? And learn from the, the, the various things that various cultures teach us. Our ancestors teach us a lot and we need to be open to hearing them. So that's one thing that I really feel like we need to do and that then those of us with privilege need to step back and need to use that privilege to create spaces where traditionally marginalized um, people can step in and step forward. And so we're talking about really lifting up all women and advocacy um, and thinking about that in the childcare workforce comes to mind because that's a historically women and women of color and it comes from a history of slavery and a history of somebody else watching your children and the pay is abysmal in terms of that. And so why is it still so undervalued and underpaid and how can we look to systems to change to help support and advance all of us? One of the things somebody mentioned to me is that nothing is personal, almost nothing is personal, <laughs> nothing is permanent, um, and nothing is perfect. And so we just all got to keep working at it and, and make the change that, that we seek. And so change, change is important. It, it's not only possible, we can make it happen, but I, I, I like that you reminded me it starts with me, right? Thank you for that, Francine. So uh, Krista, what would you add? I mean, well, it's tough to follow that, right? Um, so thank you, Francine, for, for that answer. I appreciate all of it. And, and I will just, you know, I'll add on to what Francine is saying is, as I think about this in terms of like, what can I do today, right? And, and a lot of what I think about is, tr is being intentional about seeing the greatness in people who may not see it in themselves. And a perfect example of this is like five years ago, the CEO that I worked for said, Krista, I want you to be my successor and I want you to be CEO. And when he told me that, I kind of was like, really? Um, okay. You know, and then like two years later, I'm sitting there and I'm like, damn it, he's right. And then I was like mad at myself because why didn't I think about it, right? And, and I, was, I was really irritated. And so now I want to be that person who irritates people. No, I'm just kidding. But I do, but I do want to be the person who says to, you know, women and people of color, you have greatness in you and this is how I'm going to help you. And this is what you need to do and go get after it and push them. And I feel like, you know, that could be very impactful, you know, today for me. Yeah. So Krista, you remind me that we've talked about mentorship today, but we haven't talked about being a sponsor. Yes. You describe as being a sponsor for someone, and that, that's a little different than being a mentor, but can be so impactful, you know, as you indicate. Susan, you want to wrap us up on this one? Yeah, I wish I could say it as well as Chris did, but I think that's to Francine's point about making space and stepping back and making sure that I'm using the privileges that I have so that women of color um, have that space and also to make sure that there's time to build trusting relationships across generations and across cultures. I think I've learned a lot about that in the last couple of years, watching really powerful um, leaders of color come together in strong coalitions, um, but it takes trust, it takes time, it takes nurturing those relationships. So I think 
making the space, um, helping to create places where people can build trust. And then like Krista said, really investing in people and believing in people. And like, I see you, I see your brilliance. Like, let's go. I think all of those things are, are crucially important. Absolutely. Wow. This is really great. Thank you guys. I, I'm um, reflecting on all of your comments and, you know, we're always thinking and talking about, I know at MBEP in various circles um, about, you know, this triple bottom line equity environment and economy, especially through the, you know, at MBEP, especially, you know, we're looking at all of that and what does that mean? Um, how do you balance that? So I'm curious to ask uh, and turn this over to our next three panels, Katie, Sandy, and Rosa Vivian. How does the triple bottom line approach of balancing equity, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, the environment and the econ economy specifically influence your work? And we'll uh, kick it off with Katie. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I, I think uh, it is implicit in improving people's lives which is really what we're all about. And um, you, you need all of those factors in order to have uh, a, a secure, stable, healthy life. So you need, um, you need a, a good environment, you know, and all the things that that means. Um, you need um, economic opportunity and the ability for financial self-sufficiency. Um, and then, in, you know, of course the, the, the equity piece, um, it needs to be um, true for everybody. And um, we need to really address barriers that are currently in place through, through our systems um, if we want to really achieve that improvement for everybody in our community. So, you know, certainly <clears throat> with the, the United Way mission and the way we see our role in the community, all three of those are critical. Mm. Absolutely. And in terms of, I'll, I'll follow, in terms of equity, it has, to, we have it as part of the culture of our organization and to develop systems where uh, people have an opportunity, even if they don't ask for it. Um, that is really important in order to ensure that um, individuals who may not have that experience in their upbringing have the opportunity regardless and to teach people how to ensure that they get the opportunities that that they um, are entitled to in in terms of you know I mentioned about our salary sorry but we don't wait for people to ask for a salary increase or to be told geez you know you there's an opportunity here that you may not be aware of, um, we encourage that to happen. Um, and, you know, we had a beautiful story of someone that was a, a patient as a little girl and came to the organization um, in high school. And she just walked in and asked to speak to me. And she said, I just need a job. And I said, well, what do you know how to do? And she goes, well, I'll do anything. I just need a job. And um, I hired her to do clerical work uh, because I thought she was so enthusiastic about this. And, um, and later she um, was mentored into uh, an assistant health educator. And she continued going to school, completed her, her AA, went to San Jose State, completed her bachelor's, and became a regional breastfeeding um, advisor. And, and she looks, you know, we look back at the opportunity and just, um, you know, be able to open the path to these individuals to ensure that um, while they did not know that these career paths were available to them, that, that we encourage, um, we encourage that path and we open it and, and we provide what's necessary for people to be successful. And I'm still really close to this young lady and her family. And, um, and she's proud that she was a participant of our organization and, and a consumer, and now she can provide that opportunity to others. So it's a, it's a pay it forward. The other is to do the right thing. My mother always said, do the right thing and money will follow. 
So we continue to invest in uh, different innovative approaches in order to ensure the future accessibility of services for our community. And one of the big things we did that included the environment is um, that we went solar. And, uh, and we have a building that um, is off the grid and we are able to continue to provide services to the community regardless of what happens with our power. And that's become very important um, because we also added um, charging stations and we uh, provided um, classes to our staff in terms of, you know, the power of maybe going uh, into electric vehicles. So looking at things that, you know, maybe opportunities that other people seek, the people that buy Teslas, um, but that our community can also and our, and, our, and our staff and our patients can avail themselves and, you know, maybe less affected by the cost of gas, uh, maybe less vulnerable to losses of power, which may render their families at risk if they need power um, to, to sustain life uh, in terms of people that are on oxygen or, you know, have has a, a dependency. So to make those things that are available to other people, to our uh, our community, our staff, and our patient population. And that's true equity is to operationalize it for everyone. So that's what where we continue to, to invest on and, and looking for innovation, you know, whatever's out there that you can have that too, if that's what you want. And how do we get there? And how to, you know, help people get through that path and hold their hand and also be there uh, to pick it up if something doesn't go right. And we just say, look, it's, you know, when you fall off a horse, you don't never ride a horse again, just jump back in and, uh, and it's okay. And you have not failed, you just didn't succeed this time. So keep on going. Oh, yeah, thanks, Rosa Vivian. I, I love that action orientation that you have, and it's a good lead in for our next question. Um, which is for Nanette, Francine, Kristen, Susan, how do we open up the conversation and really take action to help reduce gender bias? Anybody got any suggestions about that one? Nanette? Yeah, I, I would say we just start. <laughs> I think we just have to start. We have to model the behavior that we want to see and we have to foster those conversations. You know, um, I know she's not our Supreme Court justice yet, but she darn well better be. Um, and I was just looking, I, I pulled up her comments. Um, nominee uh, Jackson said, you know, even she struggled to find balance and she quoted, I hope you had seen that with hard work, determination and love, it can be done. And she said that to her daughters in a very unapologetic way. And it's funny, some people spun that into, oh, she apologized to her daughters. Like, no, she didn't. She actually said, I'm proud of what I've done. And I'm just, I feel like if we have more um, leaders like her and we lift up more people who are talented and prepared and, and help them get to be more talented and prepared. But I think someone like her is a role model that when the right thing is done, um, I think we have to celebrate that and remind people that we have to make space. We just have to make space and start like yesterday. So that's all I, I'm, I'm very excited about this, you can tell. And so for me, I feel like conversations like this really help and um, more of them would be great to be able to, to shine a flashlight on the data and the statistics. So we talk about using data as a flashlight and not necessarily a hammer. Sometimes you might wanna use it a little bit as, as a lightning rod, right? And um, encouraging people to disaggregate and look at their data. A lot of times people aren't paying attention. Like if you've been part of the you know, system and just been cranking away, you may not even notice that when you look at the data of who's working in your agency or who's making what and what is the gender and the racial breakdown, that there are inequities there. Um, and so I think that's one of the lessons of you know, the George Floyd situation was that that became something that we no longer could not see. And that's what we need to do with this situation and have the data and the statistics be brought out to light and then it becomes something you can no longer ignore. Um, and so I think conversations like this really help and helping people to understand how to disaggregate their data, what kinds of surveys they can use internally to do that in an easy way, because a lot of us haven't had um, a lot of experience with that um, would be uh, really helpful. 
Yeah, agreed on all counts. I mean, what we're doing here today is huge. And and another example, I I was on a panel at the Western Bankers Association with um, a group of women who run a nonprofit, and they run the financial results of banks who have women on their board versus not and women in their executive teams versus not and the information i can't help myself too i'm a long time cpa cfo type but the information it is absolutely staggering how much better the banks perform and they go all around to banking conferences and give these presentations to bank board of directors that are you know predominantly you know gray-haired white guys right and um and it is it is taking hold and it is really making a difference. So this more of that, and then what we can all do, like Nan said, every single day is just start today, you know, identifying the talent and grooming the people and encouraging people to speak up for themselves and to, you know, apply for jobs when they only have 75% of the qualifications, which is a hot button for me. Um, all of that, and it will make a difference. And I would add, you know, continuing on conversations like this, Create, intentionally creating an ecosystem in our own community for this space and this support. And, and I guess really holding a torch for optimism that yes, we know it's hard. Yes, there are, there are challenges, but we know that there's, um, there's the desire and the opportunity for us to make this kind of change and to continue to support one another. So I, I guess just um, you know, wanting to infuse it wherever we can in our culture and our um, community, I think, is really important. And, and I appreciate uh, MBEP um, sponsoring something like this as, as one example. Any other comments on that? If anyone wants to chime in, feel free. Um, other than that, you know, as we're, I'm looking at our time, we're ra wrapping up. I've also been sort of monitoring the chat. It's really great feedback. It, it, it looks like um, it's really resonating with everybody. I'm, I'm very excited. I feel like I've learned a lot. And I'm glad we were able to do this. I'm glad that you all had time to join and offer your expertise, your experience, and allowed yourself to be vulnerable, shared your personal stories. Um, so thank you for that. I'm very grateful for that. And I hope we will continue to do that. Um, it, at this point, I just sort of would like to open it up to everybody um, about you know, how do you think we can support women more to create this village? I, we've talked about a few times in these ecosystems where we could be supportive. Um, maybe we'll just do a round robin. Everybody can sort of uh, chime in, provide your last uh, sort of comments. And I'm very cognizant that this resonated with a lot of individuals. Maybe we should do this more often. And what a great way to end the month and end Women's History Month. I, I'm one of those who think like, why Women's History Month? Like one month, you know, why, why do we recognize it this one particular month? It's, it should be all the time. We're more than 50% of the population. And um, so, you know, I'm gonna get off my soapbox for a moment, but for, for those of you who are sort of, again, watching and joined us this morning, if you, uh, it looks like we have a lot of friends on here, but we also have a lot of new people um, who want to stay connected and be on LinkedIn. We also have a Facebook presence. And if you represent an organization um, or a company that's interested in becoming a member, we are membership driven. Please don't hesitate to contact myself or any other board members or to simply continue these conversation. Um, we do represent a, a multi-sector sort of approach. So with that, let's, let's uh, begin sort of concluding our thoughts and um, you know, I'll start with Sandy. How can we support women continue to create this ecosystem? And uh, what are your final thoughts this morning? I think it, it's just that simple. It, it, it sounds so easy, but it, it's taking that step and just do it. And, you know, LinkedIn, I'm going to make sure I go in and make those connections on, on LinkedIn. Um, I want to let everybody know, too, um, uh, you may have heard of Empower. We're a nonprofit organization. I'm the current president of, of Empower right now. And it's, um, you know, what we stand for is inspiring, motivating, promoting, organized women to invest. We include men as well, but we're a great networking organization also. So I, I encourage you to go to the Empower website and check that out. But it sounds so easy, Tara, and yet it's so difficult. We're all so busy. But, you know, what I would encourage as we walk away from this, 
take the time, just a moment, to maybe reach out personally and directly to one person that um, and and bring them along under and and you know offer to be a mentor or a sponsor, you know, to that one person. To, um, and I encourage if we all do that today, we make that little bit of a difference. Um, even though we're all busy, but um, who isn't? Who have you ever met anybody that says, "Oh, I'm not busy"? Um, so that that's what I leave with. Thanks, Tara. Agreed. Thank you so much, Susan. You want to add? To that? I'm just going to go round robin. And yeah, just I was going to say the same me. thing. Like, let's just every every single um, panelist and attendee today commit to do one really good thing to lift up another woman. I mean, I think we can all do that just in our day today. Agreed. Rosa Vivian? I would say provide the opportunity in spite of maybe there's nothing, well, there's a perception, but there's nothing for you. Um, and I'll sometimes, you know, when we're looking at hiring, we see that we would like to have someone stay with us for a long period of time. But sometimes there's a spark there. And you know that if you can provide that opportunity, that person may be with you a year or two, but this will launch them to bigger and greater things. And it's why not provide that opportunity? Provide that opportunity because it's a win-win. We gave, gave a person that's very committed for a short period of time, and we've launched them into greatness and opportunities that we, they wouldn't have had otherwise. So I think that each and every one of us can look at that and see, well, what is there? You know, how can we spring forward this person and make that a, a an investment that we're happy about, in spite of the fact that it may not be within the traditional sense of hiring for our organizations, and look for those opportunities to ensure that people that have not understood it, don't, don't have access to a structured environment, that they have um, that uh, ability to seek that um, structured environment of learning and advancement. And we can do one, two people at a time. Um, you know, it just, it's a pay forward process that I think will ensure that we have the true diversity and equity that we wish for the future. Sounds great. Any other last comments? I would just add one thing, which is that in addition to helping folks move forward, we also refrain from being critical of each other because honestly, we can be our own worst critics of, of other women as well. And so I think that we can step back and seek to understand better maybe where someone's coming from when we don't agree with them um, and seek to that in that way, seek to help lift them up as well. So I would say it's both and um, as we move forward too. Yeah, that's so true, Francine. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Tara, for organizing this. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists and our participants. I think this was just one of the best hour and a half I've spent in a while. I feel uplifted by all of you and so positive about our region. Yes, we have many challenges, but working together we can meet our challenges and create opportunities for everyone. So thanks for everybody for attending. And I look forward to seeing you all again in Zoom or maybe in three dimensions. Take good care. Thank you. Bye.